Welcome to Datadog On Web Security Standards. Datadog On is a series where we invite engineers working on Datadog and at Datadog to talk to us about a specific technology or an interesting engineering problem that we're trying to solve. The recordings for this, of course, will be available on datadoghq.com after the session is over. But just a few housekeeping items before we start. This is a live event, and I would love for you to interact with us as we walk through this session. If you wanted to say hi in the chat, let us know where you're coming in from. That's always uh, really, really appreciated. You know, maybe is, is this your first interaction with web security, or is web security something you've really been thinking a lot about? Uh, please ask any questions that you have during the session as well using the Q&A feature um, down there in the bottom bar in Zoom, and I'll do my best to keep an eye on that plus the chat and surface those questions to our speakers who are going to introduce themselves here shortly. But uh, first and foremost, if you're not familiar with Datadog, Datadog is a monitoring and analytics platform that helps companies improve their observability, and, uh, their observability of their infrastructure and applications. And of course, over the last couple of years, we've really, really been thinking a lot about security in general. I'm Andrew Krug. If we haven't met, I am the security evangelism and advocacy lead in the community team at Datadog. There's my Twitter there. If you want to tweet things at us while the session is going, that's always great as well. And I'm going to introduce our awesome uh, participants for the Datadog On session um, here in just a second. I'm actually going to let them introduce themselves. And we'll go ahead and we'll start uh, with Ayaz. Hi, everyone. My name is Ayaz. I'm a security engineer at Datadog. Uh, and as part of it, I really love to develop tooling to, to help uh, people understand hard questions and make them autonomous on that. Uh, and I'm here today to, to talk about how this methodolo methodology applies to web security. Hey, and I'm JB. I was CTO and co-founder at Screen. Uh, so here at Datadog since uh, the, the Screen acquisition uh, and currently building uh, the ASM and the other uh, security product lines at Datadog. And I'm happy uh, to share with you, along with uh, Ayaz, how uh, web security standards can really help uh, make a safer web. So as you know, web app security is, uh, is very broad. Um, there are lots of different vulnerabilities uh, that can be anywhere. So in security, the usual uh, things we we think about our databases, infrastructure, but you obviously also have the application. And today, an application is not complete without a browser because most users are interacting with most applications using a browser. It might be a web app as well. A lot of web apps are using a browser technologies in order to render the application. So a lot of the threats are very similar on, on both ends of the, of the spectrum. So if you think about uh, web app security, there are many, many different risks. So on one hand, you have uh, what we call RCE. It's security jargon. It means remote code execution. That means how an attacker can take over an application with executing custom code in it. it means that you just have uh, the ability to send custom command to the underlying operating system of your web application. That's somehow the graal of um, security uh, exploitation uh, for, uh, for, for attackers. You also have data exfiltration. How can you uh, trick the application into sending you more data, data that you might not be allowed to get uh, without uh, doing certain tricks or hacks. And um, a last category of, um, of attacks could be privilege escalation uh, that would help you elevate your privileges from a simple or regular user into maybe an admin user. 
helping you get access to more functionalities, maybe extract data or perform some dangerous actions on one given application. So uh, this subset, this uh, sample of, of attacks are exclusively targeting the application, all right? The server side part of your application. But we can have another category of attacks um, that would target the users and that would be stealing the session of one of your users. So maybe you can impersonate them uh, from, from somewhere else. You can also have just plain impersonation doing other techniques. Um, and last but not least is stealing the data of your users. That might be just stealing their uh, private and personal information and that could just or uh, in a, with a different impact uh, performing some privacy related attacks like exhausting uh, getting their connection location or maybe private and personal information related to the to the user so some of the prevalent risk that are actually targeting the, the web applications could be cross-site scripting uh, that's extremely uh, common that's uh, still part of the uh, uh, the most prevalent um, vulnerability on applications uh, there is a ranking that is called the OWASP top 10 and uh, cross-site scripting is not uh, directly an entry in that it's a sub entry but that's still something that is uh, very important uh, those have changed a lot over the years uh, back uh, 20 years ago when the web was fully PHP uh, to today where the web is a lot of uh, uh, React and, and full of uh, uh, Rails generated uh, HTML with templating engines, cross-site scripting is still a very um, a prevalent uh, uh, risk and, and we'll share more about that later. But that would be the most risky threat because uh, a cross-site scripting on an application is equivalent to remote code execution. You can basically do anything you want if you have a, a cross-site scripting on an app, triggering um, functionalities inside the app. If I have an XSS on Facebook, I could be able to uh, uh, add uh, friends for you, to change your settings, to do a lot of different things. That's extremely dangerous. Um, and some uh, attackers also use it to pivot and go inside your network. So for instance, you are inside your company and one of your websites has uh, been attacked via cross-site scripting. Hackers could use that to target internal services. Well, I could spend hours discussing about cross-site scripting. Let's move forward. Another one that we'll describe also uh, in more details later is the cross-site request for jury. And that's also a way to trigger actions uh, without the user knowing. And all of that is exploiting uh, simply how the web is working. A slightly more um, recent one is the cross-site leaks. And that one is about understanding, uh, extracting private information from third-party applications that you, that you uh, might be connected to inside your browser session. And then you have the ones that apply purely inside the browser. They are pretty much unrelated to your application, to the back end of your, of your app. And so that one would be dumb XSS. So the dumb is how the browser is rendering an HTML page and just within a React application or any JavaScript uh, enabled app, you might have vulnerabilities that uh, hackers might use to execute arbitrary code on your application. Privacy is also a big thing on browsers and um, you know that getting your cookies on top of performing, for instance, uh, impersonation, if I'm stealing your session, would allow attackers uh, to um, track uh, what you've been doing and what sites you've been visiting if you combine that with referral information, for instance. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a big focus of the industry today to ensure that uh, cookies are restricted into where they are sent. And the last piece uh, that is maybe the most usual 
but definitely one of the most dangerous ones are the um, the, the the vulnerabilities that are uh, regarding the underlying basis of your application. That would be the operating system, the browser itself, and even down to the CPU itself. So the Spectre and Meltdown uh, attacks from 2018 uh, really have made the headlines back in the days, and the web is still evolving today because we understand more and more the consequences of those uh, attacks. Basically, those attacks allow to steal information from one uh, process uh, within one process. And um, you know, the web is composable. You use on a single application, you are using JavaScript from, I don't know, uh, Zendesk or Intercom to provide a, a support uh, pop-up, but you might also be using um, analytic services to understand how your users are using your website. All of that is loading JavaScript from other third parties, and that's within the same process. And being within the same process makes that those JavaScript might be able to get information from everything that is happening inside that process. Maybe stealing the user session, maybe understanding things that they are not supposed to do. That's how the Spectre and Meltdown, uh, that's what the Spectre and Meltdown attacks enable. And the last one is RCE, again, remote code execution. And that would be how a hacker using uh, some specialized uh, JavaScript might be able to actually run arbitrary code within your browser. And I'm not talking about JavaScript code, but truly binary code, how they might be able to run, for instance, an arbitrary binary within your brother, within your operating system. And the things are real. You even have competitions, named for instance, Pwn to Own, where each year hackers win prizes after finding the latest, um, after demonstrating the latest uh, remote code execution within browser. The things are real. They are, um, you can buy them uh, today. It's obviously very expensive, but that's an ability that is uh, not unexpected and that really exists in the world today. So that's a lot of risk, right? I don't want to be too frightening, obviously, but you know, that's security. You need to be aware of the potential risks uh, in order to be able to mitigate them. So that's the question, okay? How, what do we do with uh, similar risks today? So there is one approach. Uh, you can fix the applications code, the frameworks. Uh, you can ensure that you have entirely read the documentation. Documentation of what? Of obviously every piece of software that you are using. So that's uh, obviously that's that's doable. That's even required, but that's super hard. And this approach do not scale, okay? So um, you cannot take one existing application and say, okay, now we are gonna secure it, so let's spend uh, six months in just uh, uh, ensuring that we don't have any flaws in it. That, that doesn't work, right? Um, so the, the, the second approach that is uh, really important is to fix the browsers, because that's actually where a lot of the vulnerabilities that I've described are happening. So within the browser, you can fix a handful of them, and that will impact the security of all of the applications that are currently using the browsers, right? So that's a great way to approach um, those uh, kind of security issues. And thankfully, browser mitigations are possible, and uh, there is a full uh, panel of security research that is actually performed on browsers. And you have a consortium from all the browser vendors that are currently um, improving continuously the browser and pushing new security uh, APIs and capabilities within the browser. This is what the W3C is about. So the W3C, on the browser standards. So it's well known uh, for uh, maintaining HTML and the HTML evolutions. Um, 
I was about to say cross site scripting, but no, CSS is, uh, is cascading style sheets. Uh, the EPUB standard, SVG, the DOM itself, um, so all of that are within the scope of the W3C. But security is also within the scope of W3C. And so this consortium is really open. It is uh, originated from the, 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 the f initial days of the web, and it was initially um, uh, led by uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who was the actual creator of the, of the web. So beyond uh, all of those uh, presenting and data formatting capabilities that, uh, that the W3C owns, it's also owning security. And there is especially an application security working group that is actually building long-term risk mitigations. The W3C is um, made of a panel of security experts, uh, usually working uh, at uh, browser vendors such as uh, Google, Mozilla, Apple, uh, Microsoft, and, and they are really defining the new security capabilities, keeping an eye on the vulnerabilities that are existing in the world today and the vulnerabilities that are emerging. And so they are ensuring that um, how the web is moving uh, can stay uh, ahead or at least up to date with the, uh, the current threats and vulnerabilities that, uh, that are happening. And again, it's the, really the spirit of the initial days of the web. So this is happening in full transparency. If you Google, if you Google W3C AppSec Working Group, you will find out um, the, the meeting notes of uh, everything that is happening there, um, uh, newsletter and, and mailing list that are fully uh, uh, open and welcoming contributions. And so you can see here a full, not a full list, but a list of things uh, that the, w, the W3C has been working on. And you can see that um, on, the, on the vertical list is a, a, a list of mitigations that they have put in place. And we have put uh, the related risk in columns. And so you can see which mitigation uh, is uh, relating to uh, which risk. It's not complete. It might be debatable because some mitigations are partly covering one and the other one. It's not um, always extremely simple, uh, but you can see that there are a lot of possibilities that are happening here. And I will let uh, Ayaz introduce to you the, the content security policy protection feature. Yes, uh, thank you, Jibé. Effectively, that's a, a lot of standards that exist uh, to be able to, to mitigate uh, all those security risks that, that we have. And I would like today to, to deep dive a bit more into one specific, which is the content security policy, and show you what it looks like and how it changes the browser uh, and its behavior. So in its most common form, the content security policy is a header sent by the web server to the browser. And by the way, uh, this could live either directly in the web app or in a proxy in front of it. In any case, uh, this is served by the server side to the browser. It contains multiple directives that changes how the browser behaves and allows or denies some of them. So for instance, we have the script source, which is a list of all the places where the browser is allowed to fetch scripts from. In this example, we are allowed to fetch from cdnexample.com. Similarly, the image source is the list of all the places where the browser is allowed to fetch images from. In this case, we don't specify any domain, but at least we want them to be over HTTPS. And the default source is the fallback for all the data types that haven't been listed previously. So what does it look like for real? We, we say that the CSP header was sent by the server to the browser. And what happened next? Let's say I want to fetch the script.js from cdnexample.com. cdnexample.com is listed as part of the script source and thus the browser allowed the request to go. 
But conversely, if I try to get script.js from hacker.com, since hacker.com is not listed in the script source, the browser will deny it. And by deny it, I mean the request won't go outside the browser. It won't be on the network. It won't reach hacker.com at all. So we'll see in a minute how this behavior changes can help mitigate real life attacks. But before that, I just want to mention that we only gave the example of fetch directives and actually content security policies are much larger. They contain more types of directives and all of them can influence slightly or more the behavior of the browser, for instance, for the well-known iframes, but also for forms and so on. So now let's jump into a real attack and see what it looks like. So let's uh, see what uh, a cross-site scripting that we write XSS in short uh, looks like. So you have several categories of cross-site scripting. Here I'm just giving one example, but most of the cross-site scripting attacks uh, can be defeated thanks to a uh, content security policy that Ayaz uh, was, uh, was describing. I'm saying most not 100 um, percent cross-site scripting is a, is a complicated vulnerability and the best way uh, to uh, protect against it is um, by ensuring that you are rendering your code using templating engine and that how you do html is handled in a, in a safe way content security policy though is a great um, defense in depth measure that can really be built uh, pretty orthogonally uh, from, from the developers of the, of the application. So let's see what a cross-site scripting attack is like. A hacker here is exploiting this application, which is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So the first thing they would say is um, trigger the application into storing a cross-site scripting payload within the database. Okay, that's really the first step. They did insert a message here because they know that the page that is rendering the messages is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. And so each time a user will render that page, the application will fetch the malicious payload from the database and insert it within the HTML that the um, application is sending back to the browser. Since the application is vulnerable to cross-site scripting, the inserted uh, HTML coming from the database is not escaped and will be executed as is by the user browser. So such a vulnerability enables the attacker to run arbitrary JavaScript within the context of the user session. So here, if you are on GitHub, you might initiate pull request, you might uh, maybe create um, uh, edits on, on things. There are a lot of things that you can do. You might star repositories. Uh, really, you can act uh, as if you were within the user session. In some cases, you might also exfiltrate the cookie and the attacker could directly retrieve uh, the actual session token and use insert it in their browser and just act on the behalf of the of the attacked user. This is uh, almost the original supply chain problem. That's kind of how I think of it, because uh, we're we we talk a lot about supply chain and dependency management uh, today, right? Um, but this was kind of the original version um, of somebody putting untrusted code that's executing into an application. It was these uh, original cross-site scripting attacks. That's a, that's a good way to think about it. Yes, uh, Andrew. And in, in the case of, uh, of a supply chain attack, we may also think of it not with the actual code coming from a database, but coming from instance from, uh, from a CDN. And if the CDN is hosted on something that is untrusted or that can be spoofed, then 
again, yes, hackers might directly change the script that is being loaded. Uh, and, and yes, that's, uh, that's the, the definition of a, of a supply chain attack. So if you are using content security policy, that's a great way to, to have an XSS protection. Uh, and so I said that this example was about one uh, kind of vulnerability that is triggered, that is leading to XSS but you have uh, a lot of others. And so for instance, if you are using inline code execution, that's exactly my example, then um, the way to uh, protect against it is to use the script SRC directive within your content security policy. And that will prevent uh, inline uh, code from executing. You might trust uh, some of the code that you know are legit, using CSP mechanisms, but it will uh, prevent all the others. You can also list authorized domains that you want to use. That was also IAS description. Here we could whitelist data.hq.com and that will prevent uh, scripts from hacker.com to load. And last but not least, the DOM cross-site scripting can also be preventing prevented thanks uh, to the content security policy. That's one of the most modern um, uh, behaviors that uh, exist in content security policy, and it's called trusted types. And if you are using trusted types, um, the example that I wrote, where you could set uh, an attribute for a, uh, an HTML tag, will not uh, be allowed unless you prove that this thing was sanitized. And that would be the same for inserting HTML, doing document.write, and uh, dangerously setting your HTML in React, and all those kind of, um, of things. So the content security policy is, is, is a great way to add defense in depth uh, within your, uh, your application. Now, let's uh, walk through another vulnerability. Um, this one is called CSRF, which stands for Cross-Site Request Forgery. Um, so the scenario is pretty simple. Um, I think we are all great users of the, of the web. Uh, sometimes uh, people say I have way too many tabs open on my uh, Google Chrome, and that's, that's, uh, that's correct. Um, so the typical way that CSRF is working is by exploiting the fact that your browser is connecting to various websites. And those websites, they might have various security privileges. For instance, your bank, that's something that is pretty important because it uh, allows you to manage your money. And you might also be connected to other things like you are browsing, um, I don't know, forums, discussions, Twitter, I don't know what. So if you are authenticated to your bank, and that you are loading another website, such as a forum, and that this forum, maybe uh, the owner of the forum is malicious, or maybe the forum just has a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Anyway, the point is the forum is executing some custom JavaScript, and this JavaScript is made to perform requests to your bank. Okay, so um, since in your browser you are authenticated to your bank, well, re doing requests from one website to your bank is possible. And if you do that, the security model of the web will ensure that the request made to your bank hold the cookies, right? So the session uh, that you have in one tab will be reused from the other tab. And so a cross-site uh, CSRF vulnerability um, is when your bank is not protecting against the fact that it can receive blind requests, for instance, triggering a wire. And that's one example. You can imagine that you do like a, a one-click um, uh, order on Amazon uh, and, and a lot of different things. So that's the cross-site uh, cross uh, request forgery vulnerability. One way to defend against it, and that's a great example of how changing the web security standards can help uh, mitigate a lot of vulnerabilities, is that in February 2020, the, all the browser had, not all the browser, started with Chrome, but it's expanding. 
Chrome added a same site attribute into the cookie that has a default value to likes. And that means that it restricts when the cookies are sent in cross-site request. Um, so that meant that um, the cookies will only be sent if the user explicitly navigated to the site. So that means if you opened a new tab and you, and you went there, if you clicked a link and there is no parent relationship between the, the, the site that was owning the, the link and the, and the target. And so this uh, change really made most of the cross-site requests for jury uh, vulnerab vulnerabilities ineffective thanks to that simple change in the browser. Now we're gonna uh, talk about how we implement content uh, security policy and uh, Ayaz, on you. It, uh, it really sounds like there might be some challenges in implementing all of these different uh, mitigations, right, Ayaz? I'm sure that's something that we think about all the time in our engineering workflow at Datadog. So you're totally right. Uh, with all of that, I am very convinced that I need to use all the security features that exist because I have understood that they could really prevent real life attacks from happening. But from an engineering point of view, uh, one thing can, can come up, uh, and it should also co co come up to, to you. What if, so all those can block the browser from doing something, which is something we want. When there's a malicious attack happening, we want to block it. But what if our setup is misconfigured? When it is misconfigured, it is possible that we actually block legit traffic and we impair the usability of the site. And this is something we want to avoid as much as possible. But here is the trick. Everything is happening at the browser level. So it is really hard to leverage the existing um, observability tools that we have that mostly focus on the server side because by definition, the server will just send the, the response to the browser, but we have no idea how this behaves in the browser effectively. So hopefully, in the example of the content security policy headers, there is a dedicated report URI feature that provides an endpoint, and it tells the browser to send a JSON payload about what it has blocked every single time it blocks something. A CSP report contains the blocked URI, so it shows what was blocked, in this case, a script, where it was blocked with the document. Over here, we, we see the Shopist website. And why it was blocked. The violated directive is the default source. And all that information provides meaningful information into how we can fix the current content security policy so that it allows the legit traffic to flow. And we still retain all the mitigations that we have against malicious attacks. I also want to mention that the content security policy comes up with a report only flavor. And what it does is it does not prevent the browser from doing something, but we would still receive the CSP report for everything that the browser would have done. And that rings a bell to me because here we can identify the flow to develop a content security policy. And it looks very similar to developing any other software feature. We deploy a policy in a report only if needed. We observe the violations that we get and we take feedback on that. We improve the policy and we loop over. At one point, when we are certain that we don't trigger any violation unexpectedly, we know that the content security policy that we have is effective for our website and we can enforce it. 
So at the end of the day, all of this workflow relies on the fact that we are able to perform analytics on the violations that, that we have. How do we do that at Datadog? Well, we leverage the built-in CSP report integration that displays the CSP report as we've seen previously, with the block URI, with the document URI, with the violated directive. But we also parse the data. We inject metadata around that, so, such as the user agent, the GOIP of the browser that, that sent the CSP report. All of that allows us to, to do analytics such as what if there is a specific family of browser that is affected by the, the policy. And, and based on this report, we can do this analytics. And we can leverage any existing tooling that already exists in Datadog to understand what happened with the CSP violation, what are the main issues, and how to, to fix them. I would also highlight that everything is happening at the browser level, and it makes sense to have this data available in our real user monitoring features. And the Run SDK sent back the CSP violation by default as of today. It provides even more meaningful information, such as when exactly on the session the violation occurred, even more metadata around the session itself, the users, the data flow that led to the current violation being triggered, and, um, uh, and we also provide a way to replay the actual session to see by ourselves how the CSP violation affected the usability of the server. So there is reporting tooling. It is nowadays fairly possible to build a CSP uh, policy from scratch without impacting prod unexpectedly. But if you already have CSP in line, I would also highly encourage you to leverage these reporting tools that exist because security is a continuous process. The CSPs are not just a create and forget, or more precisely, it is a create and you'll forget, but Datadog remembers, and we will be able to alert you with the security of rules if a new violation occurred or if a new domain occurred. And this is important for both figuring out that an XSS attack is happening, but also the more tricky one, I would say, what if a new dependency is added on the website, but the CSP was not updated accordingly? The alert can notify you right away that something odd is happening and that the CSP should be updated accordingly. So again, the reports are useful from the beginning to the actual life cycle and the, of the, the CSP. And finally, I, I would let JB highlight how we can go even deeper into from the CSP to there is an XSS happening with the new AppSec uh, features. So that's the application security monitoring product um, that is showcasing how uh, a cross-site scripting attack was detected within your, your application. And that enables uh, Datadog users to really have a single pane of glass uh, covering the, the threats uh, down to the protections of the uh, content security policy as you would be able to match these attacks with the actual um, content security policy violation reports themselves, really providing uh, a unified view uh, from the developer down to the uh, team that would be operating the content security policy.
Thank you. What do you think are some of the barriers to web developers adopting CSP today? Is it a tooling problem? Is it that they're not involved at the right level of the stack? Well, this is actually a really interesting question. Um, as of today, there isn't as much blocker as there used to be. There used to be a tooling problem. It used to be really hard to configure. The, the stack was owned by many uh, stakeholders in the organization. But nowadays, it is fairly possible for the developer them, themselves to be enabled to, to build them by themselves and to get actionable feedback when something wrong comes up. And to add up on that, it's also um, some development practices will make it easier than others. And one typical uh, is if you are using uh, some templating engines in server-side rendered HTML, like Django app or node server side, um, using a, a strongly typed templating engine will make it possible to automate uh, the generation of the content security policy and had some nuances or, um, or cryptographic signature of the hashes that are ways to trust your scripts with your security policy. You also have uh, web pack plugins that will automate uh, listing the tools and what uh, is used as a, as a CDN standpoint. On the other end, if you are uh, using a, a single page app, uh, such as Angular or React, the um, uh, new feature that is called trusted, trusted Types will really enable you to have a strong protection against uh, DOM-based cross-site scripting attacks at the uh, cost of uh, implementing a few uh, sanitizers that you can very easily find great examples uh, online. So I fully agree with uh, with uh, IAS. Things are becoming much and much simpler, but especially if you are using uh, the most modern spectrum of the of the technologies. I would add one last thing, uh, which is uh, maybe a, a cultural shift that that is happening uh, as of today. Uh, we had the, the dev, we had the ops, now we have the DevOps. And nowadays, there, there is a, a way to, to be able to do security as part of that and to be sort of a DevSecOps. And that's really what all of this is about. Security is as any other regular software development as we all know. Any advice uh, for folks who want to get started, uh, recommended resource, uh, something that they should go read uh, if they just want to dive in and see you know, about putting CSP in their application? So I think the web.dev web um, website uh, has, a, has a security section that is uh, really is, uh, amazing. So that's one of the resources I would, uh, I would recommend. Um, we are releasing a blog post around uh, using uh, Datadog uh, as a way to, to monitor uh, and to build your uh, content security policy. That would be a second resource. Um, and I would say the usual ones, the MDN, which is uh, personally my, my favorite uh, for, for sure. And if you are a developer, um, look at your um, framework documentation, Rails as ways to help you automate um, CSP generation. So does Django, uh, React, um, all of those uh, frameworks have great security resources. All right, great. Well, I think that that is all the questions we have time for. JB, Ayaz, thank you so much for being here again with us today for this Datadog on session. Um, once again, the recording will be available after the session. And uh, definitely, if you're attending, check out Datadog Careers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.